In this episode, I'd like to open a little window into the years 2016 and 2017 and talk a little bit about how I both got a master's degree in screenwriting and at the same time had one of the most difficult years in my life, as well as encountering amounts of anxiety, self-doubt, depression on a daily consistent basis in a way that I didn't think was possible. And I say little window because the way I want to view that particular academic year is through the lens of one generalized anxiety disorder, the label that had been sort of ascribed to me. Once I started speaking to professionals about, okay, what's going on? They sort of seemed to point to, okay, it probably is this. And I'll explain that in a moment. So one generalized anxiety disorder and two, what I'm just calling a CBT toolkit, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy toolkit. Another way to look at these two things is a very simple problem and solution. So first, let's talk about problem. Let's describe what was going on in that time in my life. And then let's talk about the solution or the toolkit that came into my life that supported me to confront that problem. So in a word, that problem was anxiety. In two words, it was anxiety and depression, but that's not enough. And in three words, it was generalized anxiety disorder, but that's still not enough. But perhaps I might get to that in a little while. I think for people who are unfamiliar with what happened to me, starting from the framing my experience in a sort of clinical manner might ground things. And then maybe I can take a step back from that and sort of put on it layers of, you know, why me? Why specifically me is the person who went through this experience? So first of all, let's define what generalized anxiety disorder is. Anxiety as we know, other than being a sort of being stuck state where we can't proceed forward mentally, we are reliving a certain event or anticipating a certain event and fantasizing about what could go wrong. Very simple, uh, vague, but good enough definition of that mental aspect of anxiety. Of course, there's a physical component when it gets quite intense, and it might go into the territory of what we might call an anxiety attack, where things start to happen from top to bottom. The physical component of having so many thoughts is one of being a bit fatigued. The physical component of having so many thoughts as well is one of your body saying, okay, there's a threat, there's something wrong, there's something that is causing or providing danger in the environment that we must be cautious of. And that will cause hyper awareness, which is a state where stimuli in the surrounding environment that would usually be ignored because they've caused no previous harm, like the sound of birds, the the passing of a car, the passing of a random individual, the words they might be saying on the phone or to a friend, these things that are in our background that we usually might ignore, they suddenly become part of our awareness. And not only just that, they start to threat, well, appear to us as threats. So our body starts to send us jolts of whatever it sends us. I don't know if it's cortisol or something along those lines, adrenaline. And these are physically tasking alerts. And so that's hyper awareness. There's also a, a presence of palpitations, a very quickened heart rate. And once this state, which as per my description is now quite in the in the midst of the anxiety attack, once this state develops in the moment quite a bit, you might get things like pinwheel vision, or where your peripherals sort of start to fade into black, and you can only really see a thin sort of telescopic view of what's in front of you because your body is so physically tasked tasked, and your mind is so phys is so tasked as well. And so some people know the mental component of anxiety, the worrying. Some people know both the mental and the physical and perhaps a bit fewer people know, 
you know, when this is a recurring phenomenon, when it's happening every week or every day or every two days, and it becomes a sort of dysfunction in your life, a disorder or a lack of order. <clears throat> and there are different kinds of anxiety disorders. I won't go into them. I will just go into generalized. It is particular in the quality where if you encounter the crippling kind of anxiety that I just described at length in a certain frame or dimension, like for instance, I was a student at a screenwriting program, master's program. One of the experiences of that program was going to class with the expectation perhaps that homework might be discussed in a sort of this conversational setting. Another expectation from many, but just for sake of discussion, is that you know, maybe today you're going to pitch one of your stories. So these are, for example, just a couple of experiences that are very enclosed in the screenwriting master's dominion, let's say. If one of those caused me anxiety, the feelings, some version or variation of the feelings that I described earlier, generalized anxiety disorder makes it so that that anxiety feeling would generalize and spread to other dominions or dimensions in your life in such a way where you are at the supermarket or you are in the London tube and you are in the process of doing the normal tasks that are ascribed to those dimensions or dominions like swiping your oyster card or sitting idly in the tube car and thinking idle thoughts or what could I do to pass the time or in the grocery shopping you're browsing at items near somebody in the aisle or you're interacting with the cashier with the store clerk you might be doing one of these tasks that are ascribed to those particular dimensions and suddenly you will get that let's call it anxiety attack and if you don't know what's happening, you will feel like you are dying without exaggeration. It is completely awful, especially if you don't know what is happening and why. And so the fact of the anxiety attack makes it so that you start to think there's something wrong with you. You are not well. And that note, that belief, I am not well, I am not, there's something wrong with me, helps the generalized anxiety disorder spread to other things from the classroom to the tube to the grocery store to walking from the grocery store to the house to every single thing that you do that is outside of your bedroom let's say and perhaps even th some of the things that you do in your bedroom so what i just described to you is a state that i found myself in in london and the reasons as to why that it was me specifically with my background and my history that found myself in that situation for the first time in my life to, with that intensity, let's say. I will go into that perhaps later or perhaps in another episode. But I found myself in that situation, not once, not twice, but every day, multiple times a day for something along the lines of eight months, give or take. So that was, that was the problem in my life in 2016, 2017. And it was pretty bad. I don't need to go deeper into giving you more of an indication of how the, that felt spread across time. I think your imagination can <laughs> conjure up a solid image of what that's like if it's repeated for so many days and so many times a day. Then the solution came or the toolkit came, the CBT toolkit. And it came from a person who is a very experienced cognitive behavioral therapist. His name is Gary Hawk. Hawk is spelled at its, as it's pronounced, but with an E at the end. If you're curious about reaching out to him, having a chat with him, exploring, creating a space where you might want to manage certain feelings that are similar to the ones I've described, or perhaps some lower degree, then I would recommend the quickest way to do that is to Google search Gary Hawk, Hawk as the way I described spelling it, with an E at the end, CBT. And either of the first two links that pop up should lead you to a place where you would be able to contact him directly. So Gary came into my life maybe four months into the worst of these anxiety or 
panic attacks. And he started to offer me certain tools from the CBT toolkit, which I f might, which I feel might be useful to just touch upon and discuss both for the sake of what this podcast is trying to do. And perhaps for me to kind of get in touch again with these things and see how I might be or might not be applying them in my life. So the tools that I'm going to sort of touch upon today, the ones I have in mind, are Mind the Gap, Wise Mind, the ALBs and NFBs table, and journaling. One way to look at Mind the Gap, other than being this sort of warning label that is between the gap on the platform that you're standing on and the tube station and the, the actual tube, this is on the floor. Many people who have been to London surely are very familiar with the the phrase mind the gap. From a CBT perspective, it is a reminder that you are not your feelings. There is a space between the feeler and the feeling. Part of the issue, part of the problem for me was that I was associating myself with that anxiety. I am this fear. I am these palpitations, these pinwheel vision, these running thoughts. This is me now. And so one of the first things we discussed is mind the gap. Mind the gap between you as the person who are encountering feelings as objects of your consciousness and those objects. There is a clear space there if you allow yourself to see it. And for a time, we worked purely on that, on the noticing of there is this thing called fear. It is designed to help you. It does not have 2020 vision. It only can see things that have threatened you in the past. So a previous anxiety attack in a specific context and say, this looks familiar, please be careful. When you mind the gap, you take a step back from the, those red alarms and red flags and you try to re-encounter the feeler. The person who is sort of the neutral, clear-minded center, the person who has the capacity to determine, hey, is this actually a threat? Is this actually something to be afraid of? I had lost touch with that clear mind after repeated exposure to anxiety attacks. So mind the gap, practicing it for long enough, saying, okay, this is fear. Is there a threat? No. All right, fear, I don't need you. Just doing that time and time again and being in the space of what triggers anxiety, which was everything, helped those feelings sort of start to abate. The second tool that Gary introduced me to was wise mind. And in short, it is a realization, one that you have and can train the ability to stop and think before you act out of habit. And two, that's, that that's not just a realization, that it's a, a part of you, a mind that you have. Wise mind in itself deserves its own sort of episode or thought or topic. But in the in a simplest sense, it's it's like uh, if, if people are familiar with meditation, it's kind of like the meditative mind. It is mind the gap, but it is uh, there's a layer on top of that, which is what new thoughts can I encounter about what I might like to do in this space, which, hey, perhaps I'm actually familiar with and perhaps I act in a certain way with I'm at the grocery store, I get a sort of anxiety attack in 2017. And my first thought is, OK, run away. Okay, what if I'm taking a step away from that? What if I'm minding the gap? All right, there's nothing, there's no threat. All right, but what can I do now? If my habit recently has been to run away. Wise mind is the thing that allows you to, it is the source of thoughts that sort of, what could you do now that isn't running away? And it is also the mind that allows you to encounter those thoughts and be with them and perhaps take an action. Like, okay, there are going to be some physical fear symptoms for the next five, 10 minutes, but it's okay. And I'm just going to do my shopping and I'm going to smile at the cashier and I'm going to check out and I'm going to walk out of the doors and I'm going to whistle the song that I've been listening to and I'm going to appreciate the cool breeze. And in that sense, wise mind is the tool that helps you start to shift literally habits from the from the roots. And really, it's, it deserves its own 30 minute discussion, at least it's it's such a wonderful and powerful tool. And there are things around it that can be discussed as well, other minds that interact with it. 
but I think it's its its own thing. The third out of the four tools I wanted to touch on today is the ALBs and NFBs table. ALB and NFBs uh, is short for authentic legitimate behaviors and negative freedom behaviors. This table is one which allows you to recognize, okay, and organize the behaviors that make you be better in relation to ones that don't. Negative freedom behaviors are behaviors that by the by its name steal your freedom. They are ones that cultivate uh, an avoidance, a running away. So running away from the grocery store is a negative freedom behavior. Avoiding thinking about university assignments and watching series is a negative freedom behavior because you're telling yourself indirectly when you do these things that this feeling of fear or anxiety is valid it's strong and it's something that is stronger than me and so i must do something to really move away from it without awareness without attention and so running away or distracting myself and so it steals away from your freedom your ability to be in relationship with these things and say no it's not that bad actually the assignment i can just break it down into steps the store there's no threat i can do the stuff i said earlier and albs are authentic legitimate behaviors authentic legitimate behaviors are ones that are both authentic to how you're feeling and also legitimate in terms of your relationship with the world around you not just legal but also it's sort of in it it regards or respects that there are social beings around you, institutions, and there is an unspoken sort of way to act towards those things while also trying to express authenticity. So the, the list of positive things I was talking about when I was talking about wise mind in the supermarket, accepting that there's going to be some physical feelings, interacting with the store clerk in a positive way, the cashier, going out and whistling, that is authentic to the to the you that wants to be in that moment in that grocery store and not engage with the feelings of fear and it is also legitimate to what's sort of expected from a person in a grocery store and so why i call it or why we called it the albs and nfbs table is because what we would do is organize these as a list both authentic legitimate behaviors and negative freedom behaviors and we would encourage me, the the me in 2017, to look at this table and try to see, try to keep a bit of a track or a record rather on what happens when I practice more ALBs than NFBs in a given day or in a given week. And I had like a sort of Excel where I would count them. And I noticed that my anxiety would fluctuate. The more ALBs, the less anxiety, the more NFBs, the more anxiety. And it was very interesting to see that. And it empowered me to pick up more ALBs and drop more NFBs. The last thing I wanted to touch on in this solution discussion was journaling. It is the simplest tool. It isn't even one that we actually discussed in our sessions, Gary and I, but our sessions were a form of journaling, a form of reflection, and they were very empowering because they were just moments where we were looking back at what we had done, reflecting on our feelings, our, my, my feelings, my experiences. And based on that reflection, creating a sort of new plan that was designed and engineered by me at the time on how did I want to act in relation to things that had passed, noting all the stuff that we had been working on. And so I became very aware that those sessions were key, but also that I couldn't meet with Gary forever. And those two things helped me see that basically what we were doing when I actually had learned the CBT tools was a form of journaling. And so that was a way where It's like stop and take a beat and how can you make it better? These four tools are four of more of many that Gary sort of offered to me, but they are, I would say the core ones that had the biggest influence in my life. To this day, I, I use mind the gap when I have an intense feeling that sort of hijacks me. I take a, I'm, if I'm mindful, It's not an easy thing. It needs some practice and I still don't have a full grasp of it. But if I'm mindful and I'm swept up by fear, for example, or anger, I can take, I started, I'm starting to be able, or I've started in the last few years to be able to take a mental step back from that and say, hold on a second, and really just come quickly into contact with the feeler very quickly. So the feeler is the person who's not feeling anything, who's just 
the person who's been caught by this object in his consciousness, but you, you dissociate. So I'm able to establish contact with the feeler and say, and, and drop all the feelings just for a moment. Say, hold on a second. Do I actually need that? And just that break can have a profound impact on the life of the anger or f fear or sadness. For a wise mind, I need to re reflect a bit if I'm still using it. I mean, of course, we, we use wise mind all the time. It's, it's small tweaks that we do, you know, oh, I, I switch on the, the oven light by, by habit and how to manage that. This is a, a wise mind. I don't want to leave the oven light on because it will burn out. These are all definitely wise mind things that we do, small ones. I, I think I'm thinking about bigger wise mind things. I guess the most prominent one that sort of pops to mind is, is a podcast like this and my own personal journals is, is a space in which wise mind can flourish. And so I would say that it is still there. What is it now? End of 2022. So five and a half years after. ALBs and NFBs table, I don't use it in a similar way. I don't track all the positive behaviors that I'm doing and negative behaviors in that Excel, very structured way anymore. But I am working with a nutritionist and we are very aware of many positive behaviors and that have I've been replacing negative behaviors. So it is, I guess it is something that is still part of my life. And journaling is, is my, is my religion almost. It is the, the tool that is behind this, uh, this podcast. I, I've been voice journaling for maybe four years. And I think it's allowed me to be able to express my thoughts in a somewhat <laughs> understandable and clear way. So yeah, um, for whoever's listening, if you need a space, if something here, that you've heard has resonated with you with a, a need that you have and you feel it is based on a lack something that it's not in your life and that one thing that might help is like a space to discuss these things first of all amazing that you recognize that really it's not many people who would like you people would live a long time before sometimes before being able to sort of admit that to themselves so good job and second of all cbt might be beneficial for you just based on the feeling that you're encountering right now and third of all i personally do recommend speaking with gary it is this is a bit of a you know testimonial for him because of the gratitude i feel but i'm okay with that <laughs> um I'm very grateful to the guy and so if i can connect him with people that need his support that is a an absolute pleasure of mine. And so, yeah, I, I will say it again, the, the best way and quickest way to reach him is just to Google Gary, G-A-R-Y, Hawk, H-A-W-K-E, C-B-T on Google. And the first two links that pop up will probably be his. Uh, his website is also garyhawk.org, just to sort of drive that home. You can also feel free to message me and I can share uh, contact details. He will offer you, or any other CB therapist, will offer you a space to explore what you might be going through. Then that space is the key, really. The tools are immensely helpful, but the space is the, the real changer. The breaking the pattern of your life and just creating this room in itself would create great, great changes in your life.